Thank you. All right. So, is that it on? All right. Fantastic. So, uh, so when we talk about continuous compliance, you know, irrespective of what organization it is, you uh, have some sort of compliance requirements, whether it is internal compliance requirements or whether you have external regulatory compliance. And, and the challenge is to ensure that how you are meeting those requirements and you are meeting them continuously, right? You're not waiting for three months for an audit to happen and then you have the findings and then you go implement the security changes. So the, the whole idea when you move on to the cloud is to take the advantage of the benefits that the cloud has to offer and then you can automatically remediate and uh, all your security controls that are implemented in order to meet your compliance objectives. So, uh, so key things when we talk about governance and compliance, um, you, you, one of the, uh, the challenges is that you, know, you need to have uh, a full uh, understanding of your IT environment, you know, what assets you have, uh, you also need to understand what uh, compliance requirements you have, and then how do you translate those compliance requirements and security controls uh, into the technical rules that will then be evaluated, right? So w one of the key requirements, and I'm sorry about the structure of it, I'm not sure why it's coming up like that. Uh, but yeah, so uh, for your governance and compliance, it's important that you have that uh, information handy. And if you look at the traditional environments and, uh, and how large the scope is, uh, where you have multiple assets, there are changes that are being done to the assets, there are new assets that are being add added. And to make things more complex uh, and, and more challenging when you move on to the cloud is that every software configuration is actually an asset. And you need to ensure that you're tracking that asset and you need to ensure that that asset is then meeting your compliance objectives. So, so why do we automate, right? So one of the key things for us to automate is to make this whole job easier, right? We need to ensure that I can capture all my assets and I can view all my assets in real time and at the same time I can apply the various security controls. So if you look at, for example, the CIS, which is uh, just for at a single host level, it has you know, hundreds of security controls that you need to implement. So multiply that by the number of instances that you will have, you know, from 5 to 10 to 20, depending on how large your environment is, and then you need to ensure that the CIS or you know, your other compliance requirements are being met by them, and if there is ever a change done to your environment, which we know that it is a dynamic environment, you are going to be making changes to, to your uh, assets, you have to ensure that nothing is broken. And if there is anything broken, you are capturing it and then you are fixing it, right? So it does become quite a challenge if you're trying to achieve the continuous compliance uh, objectives uh, using uh, the traditional methods. So you, uh, you need to look at automating that function on how you can continuously do an assessment, how you can ensure that if someone has gone ahead and made a change to uh, any of your assets, it can be automatically remediated. So AWS Config is one of the services that helps you achieve your continuous compliance, right? So what AWS Config does is when you enable the service, it creates a snapshot of all your assets, and it then starts putting each of those in on the timeline. So essentially, you will see the dashboard, which shows you a timeline. It will show you what are the assets and what changes have been made. It will also show you the dependencies. It will also show you the relationship. So for example, you have an EC2 instance that is connected to your RDS, which is your relation database service. If someone comes in and breaks the link between the two, you will be able to see what change was made to EC2 and what was the impact because of that, because the security group was changed, whether it was RDS, that connection was removed. So it has a full relationship and uh, dependency map that is created for you as well, and it helps you get, gain that visibility. Now, uh, it's not just limited to looking at the assets in the cloud. You can even monitor what's done at the OS level, so your patches, your installed applications. So you can even monitor the state of those and then record them on, uh, on using config on a timeline. One of the key things uh, when we talk about config is config rules. Now, config rules plays a very important role when we talk about uh, automating the function. So what config rule does? So it's available in two different formats. So we have what we call AWS managed rules. So we have about 70 plus ready-made rules, which you can uh, just simply go onto the console and start using them. But if you have specific compliance requirements, you can write your own custom rules, right? And when you write your custom rules, it 
uh, it, they start evaluating. So the moment you configure a rule, and I'll, I'll walk through a demo on how the rules are triggered. So you have two different options on how the rules get triggered is when you do a configuration change or whether you are doing it periodic, right? There are certain elements you would want to do on a periodic basis, and, and I have an example for both of them to show you. Uh, and, and those rules are then run against all the changes that you make, and it will then show you on a dashboard on whether you are compliant or not, right? So I'll just walk through how, how, how config works and you know, what actions that can be taken. So as I said, it records everything. Uh, it is, uh, when it is recording everything, it's essentially passing it through an engine where it is normalizing all of that, and it is creating a history of all the snapshots, and all these snapshots are then saved on S3, right? So you have the entire history of what has been done from a configuration perspective saved onto an S3 bucket, and then you can create, uh, you, have the, you have two options, right? So whether uh, you want to uh, do a manual intervention and you want to fix something, so this is where you have your SNS, or simple notification service, so let's say you have an asset, uh, that asset was changed, uh, a rule gets run against that asset, and it will send you a notification via email saying, have a look at it, someone has made a change and you are not compliant anymore. The other option that you have is that you can use Lambda using API access and you can automatically remediate that, right? And in the examples that I have today, we are going to see how you can do that automated, right? So we don't want to wait for notifications. We want to be always compliant. We don't want our dashboard to go red. We want it to stay green. And I'll, I'll walk through a few use cases which will, will showcase that. So uh, some common use cases, right? Why we're we using config? Yes, we, we want to do continuous compliance, but what other things that we can do. Uh, continuous monitoring. So you're continuously monitoring your environment. It is recording the changes, and it is continuously monitoring it for changes, right? So it makes it very, very convenient for you to see what assets you have and what changes are being made. And then it is doing continuous assessment as well. So you know, again, as I said, you don't have to wait for two months, three months for an audit to be done. You can do an audit every time there is a change, every time there is a new asset that is being added to it. So you are then doing a continuous assessment of it as well. Change management. So I talked about how whenever you are changing a certain asset, it has a dependency and relationships. So when you are doing your change management, you can look at what will be the dependencies, what is the relationship of this asset with other assets, so you can plan your changes accordingly. And if you extend that functionality onto your troubleshooting aspect, it is really uh, you know, the, the wealth of knowledge, uh, sorry, the wealth of information that you can get from uh, having that relationship and the dependency map is, is uh, what can help you in troubleshooting as well. If something goes wrong, uh, you can have a full history of what change was made. You have a full relationship uh, and the dependency map that can then help you do your troubleshooting much more effectively. So quick recap on key features before we get into the demo. So uh, config rules, really important. Uh, your compliance and your continuous compliance are driven by config rules. So you have to develop those config rules based on your individual uh, requirement when we talk about uh, you know, your internal compliance requirements, whether it is uh, ensuring that everything that you have in, uh, in let's say, your uh, data at rest needs to be encrypted. You can write a rule and say, please check that data in EBS volume, which is the elastic block storage volume, is encrypted. Uh, make sure anything that is put into the S3 bucket is encrypted, right? So you can apply those config rules and evaluate whenever there is a change. Uh, there's a config uh, resource history. I talked about the history, so you see it on timeline, what changes are being made. Um, and you can also see the software history, right? So it's not just limited to the assets in there. It's, it's definitely the assets which are from a software perspective as well. Uh, snapshots, really, really useful. You can see the different snapshots that have been taken, and then you will understand what changes have been made. Uh, Resource relationship, I, I talked about resource, resource relationship already. And I think the, uh, the, the dashboard, the dashboard is really important. It gives you a full snapshot of all your compliance requirements, what is compliant, what is not compliant. So I'm just gonna uh, get into the demo and show you what the dashboard looks like. So, so this is the dashboard, right? So basically, uh, so we, we are fully compliant right now. And the reason for that is that I've got the rules that are built in, uh, which are continuously evaluating. And, and hence the reason uh, it shows everything green. So uh, what, what we'll do, we'll run through the first security policy. So, so our security policy is that our VPC flow logs, which is you know, our virtual private cloud flow logs, are always enabled. That means no one can go and turn off my logging, right? My, my flows need to be on. I need it for the purpose of visibility inside my environment. So, so I'll have a look at that. Uh, 
So here is the policy that I have for uh, VPC flow logs. And this is the timeline that I was talking about. So you can see uh, the timeline, which basically shows you uh, what changes have been made. So I will go and turn off the flow logs. So here's my VPC. And if you look at my flow logs, I currently have the flow log added. That's here. And I'm going to delete it. All right, so the flow log is deleted now. So now what will happen that the configuration change has been triggered. And if you look at the policy, the policy essentially is based on uh, a configuration change, which is done to a EC2 VPC resource type. Now when that happens, uh, the CloudTrail is recording the API call. So the CloudTrail um, recorded that I have just deleted it. Now it's going to send a trigger to uh, config. Uh, so it takes about two to three minutes for it to send the trigger and then run the rule. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to push the button and reevaluate it here. So I will go back. So it shows us compliant. And if you look at the first rule, it shows us compliant because what it has done, uh, config rule has just run, and it has detected that I'm non-compliant. But the action that I have taken after that is rather than saying that I want to enable uh, notification by SNS, I'm calling a Lambda function. So what Lambda is doing, it's going to go into the VPC, and it's going to add a flow log. So it's just going to refresh it, and we see the flow log now has been added. So you're compliant, right? So no one can just go and delete things which they're not authorized to do so. So we'll move on to a second scenario. So one of the uh, things that uh, when you're creating IAM users is every user gets an access key, right? And if you look at it, there are many users who do not use the access key ever, right? It's just sitting over there. They have never used it, and it's a security risk, right? And the security risk is that I don't want to be having my access keys available outside on GitHub published accidentally. And if the users are not using these keys, uh, we need to make sure that they have been disabled. So I'll just uh, go in. So this is my policy for deactivating all the used keys. So I will go into IAM and so within IAM, I'll have two users that are configured. And these two users have uh, security keys that have not been used. So what we are going to do is. Uh, so if you look at it now, because the, uh, the rule has already run, and it has already made them inactive, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to activate both the keys. So we go in the security credentials, and we are going to make this active. So this key is active, and I'm going to do the same with my second user. So the key is inactive, and we'll make it active as well. So now, if we look at my dashboard, it will show me that the keys are active, right? And the keys have not been used. So one key has not been used for nearly 243 days, and the other key has not been used for two days. Now, this value is configurable. So you can say, OK, I want to go and run uh, this particular uh, policy every time uh, when my users have not used the keys in the last 30 days, say, for example. So this configuration change is uh, done on a periodic basis. So, and the, the reason that you need to do this on a periodic basis and not on a configuration change is because there is no configuration change happening. A user has not used a key, so there is no trigger that is happening because of a configuration change. So you can run a periodic test, and what you do that uh, you can configure from anywhere from one hour to 24 hours to how this rule will run and to in, in disable the keys that have not been used. So we'll, so we'll go back to our dashboard, and again, we see it compliant because the rule has run. I'll just... Uh, Make sure I just reevaluate it. Sorry. So I'm just going to reevaluate it. We go back to our rules. Uh, and it can take just some time to get it back. And so this one uh, typically takes a little bit of a while compared to the other ones because of uh, the calls that it makes. But it will eventually come through, and you'll have. Uh, the keys that have now been made inactive. So essentially, it is trying to inact, uh, make the keys inactive. So you can see now it's gone, right? So if you go into a user and security credentials, it has now deactivated the key, right? So it has, again, 
uh, help you achieve your compliance objectives, and you know, you, it's a zero-touch solution, so you didn't have to do any changes. Uh, you simply met the compliance requirement. So the next one, uh, this is a very, very common one that we see. Uh, you have a security group that is configured for your web-based applications, and you would say, I only want to allow port 80 and 443. I don't want any other security group to be allowed. So we can, again, create a security uh, policy. Uh, one of the rules that have been created is to check for security groups. So, so what this rule is doing, it is making sure that 80 and 443 have been enabled. So if there is any other port that has been opened up, if say someone goes up and opens SSH to the world or adds RDP, uh, it will remove those ports and it will add 80 and 443. So I'll just quickly jump onto the e security group. All right, sorry about that, it's a bit slow. All right, it's very slow, sorry. Okay, there it is. So I'll click on the security groups. All right, so you can see right now it has both 80 and 443 because the rule has already run and it is making it uh, compliant. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna delete both of them, right? We delete, we're gonna save, and again, what has happened is the trigger has sent through, okay, that someone has gone ahead and changed the, the security group, so we reevaluate it to make sure that the rule is run. We go back, it shows us compliant, and when I go back in and I refresh, so my ATN 443 are added back in, right? So this really, really helps because when we're looking at our web-based infrastructure, one of the very common things that can happen, and especially it happens with the security groups in real time. So you know, the moment you add a port, it is immediately taken into effect. There is no approval process. So this really helps you to ensure that you're meeting your compliance objectives. So the last one that I have is to ensure your pass password policy is applied, right? So every organization has a, uh, has a password policy. You create you know, uh, policy based on your internal organizational requirements, and you want to make sure that no one is going and altering that. So what we'll do is, um, so I have a, a password policy enforcement. So essentially, it enforces a, a password policy. And what I will do is I will go and delete my entire password policy, right? So if someone just goes and says, hey, you know, I'm not, I don't want to modify it, I want to delete the entire policy, right? Let, let's not do there. So, so here is my password policy, and I'm just going to delete the policy, right? So the policy is deleted, as you can see, now it's back to the default policy, there is nothing checked, so there's no, um, you know, uh, rules applied to what, what your password needs to be like. So again, uh, it's a configuration triggered, uh, rule, so it's going to ch uh, detect that there has been a change uh, to the IAM user, and uh, you know, the, uh, that's the resource that it's looking at, and we reevaluate the policy, and then it's going to make it compliant, and when we go back, uh, and this again, typically the IAM controls take a little bit of while than the other one, so let's see if it has done it. All right, so our policy is back, right? So it has enforced the policy. So it's detected, someone deleted it, and then it has enforced it back in saying, hey, I want to be continuous compliant. So, so this, uh, you know, these are just you know, some of the examples. There are more uh, <laughs> cases based on your individual requirements from your organizational requirements that you can write these rules. Uh, these rules are available, by the way. We want to make them available on GitHub so you can start uh, using them, and then you can start modifying the way you want to. And uh, hopefully that can help you meet your compliance objectives as well. Thank you very much.